and we'll let people filter in for just a minute. Hello and good evening from Thorough Farm. I am Rebecca Migdahl, Executive Director of Thorough Farm Trust, the organization that preserves the birthplace of Henry David Thoreau and promotes conversations about nature, society, and living deliberately. Tonight's program is part of the Right Connection at Thorough Farm, a program in partnership with the Thorough Society in which we feature author talks and writing workshops to encourage reflection and expression, especially around topics Thoreauvian, writing from personal experience, close observation of nature, and exploring our relationship with the earth and each other. We're able to present this program for free as part of the Right Connection because of generous support from our donors, and we encourage you to donate what you can to help us present more wonderful programs in the future. This spring, we have the privilege of presenting a series of talks through the Right Connection that explore writing from personal experience, including tonight's program, which looks at how Thoreau did that, and continuing next week with a free virtual program with author Tom Montgomery Fate in conversation with Sandy Stott, and including an opportunity to hear from award-winning author George Colt in person in June. Please check our website, www.thoroughfarm.org for these and other Right Connection programs. We're streaming tonight's virtual program from the birthplace of Henry David Thoreau on Virginia Road in Concord, Massachusetts. And we are now officially open for public tours for the season. So please, if you're in town, stop by, have a look. We are really excited to welcome the public back. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website. We're also going to monitor the chat feature on Zoom so you can join in the conversation. So please type your questions into that chat feature. Tonight, we are joined by Kareen Smith, writer, poet, longtime librarian, outdoor educator, and Therobian. She's the author of Westward I Go Free, Tracing Thoreau's Last Journey, Exploring Thoreau's 1861 Journey to the West, the last, longest, and least known of Thoreau's excursions. Kareen also wrote Thoreau for Kids, His Life and Ideas with 21 Activities, which introduces Thoreau to younger audience through activities like building a model of his cabin from Walden, keeping a daily journal, or planting a garden. Green supervises the Thoreau Society at the shop at Walden Pond, and Thoreau Farm is really lucky to count her among one of our fabulous tour guides. We're delighted to have her here with us tonight to explore Thoreau's approach to writing, the methods, techniques, and perspectives that help him become an enduring literary voice. So with that, I will turn it over to Green to take us through Henry's writing. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you, everybody associated with Thoreau Farm and also uh, the Thoreau Society and Mike Frederick, who is being our technical advisor today. <laughs> and um, thanks for everybody for um, joining us tonight. And I'm in the birth room and you can see Henry behind me. <laughs> it's a little intimidating to have Henry behind me, but that's okay because we're gonna have a PowerPoint here. And uh, so you're not gonna see him. Uh, and I'm not gonna see him uh, for a little bit. So um, I'm going to do this. Okay, um, ba -dum, ba -dum. there we go. So our, our topic tonight is what can an aspiring writer learn from Henry David Thoreau. And when I started this out, I had some ideas, but uh, I came up with a lot more than I expected, actually. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as Rebecca said, uh, if you have questions or comments, put them in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Okay. So hang on. It'll be a while till we get to the end. Thanks for joining me again tonight. Naturally, today, when we consider Thoreau, to be an accomplished writer, 
Um, that's what we consider him to be an accomplished writer. Of course, back in his own day, many people didn't. Even he may have questioned his writerly status from time to time. We, of course, don't question it. But we also, I don't think, consider enough or recognize enough how much of his life truly was dedicated to writing. And this is a reason why I came up with this program, to emphasize the importance of the act of writing to Henry Thoreau and how we can learn from his example. These days, when you go to a writer's conference or to a workshop or even to an author's talk with a book signing, and um, for illustration, I happen to use one of mine, which was actually happened here downstairs in 2016. Um, you'll find aspiring writers who are eager to pose lots of questions to published authors. How long did it take for you to write this book? What's your process of writing? Do you use a computer or do you write it all out by hand? Are you a planner or a pantser? Meaning, do you plan and outline all the work before you start writing? Or do you fly by the seat of your pants and just go with the flow, however it develops on its own? Everyone wants to know the secrets of publication success, however they measure it, so that they can do their best to emulate it or to duplicate it. And aspiring authors will ask questions and will take advice, however they can get it, from whomever they meet. Actually, Thoreau himself was not immune to this kind of search, thirst for knowledge. By the time he met Ralph Waldo Emerson, that man was already becoming known as a popular Lyceum speaker. He'd already published his first book called Nature, which of course ended up launching the transcendental movement in America. And Henry, fresh out of Harvard, must have mentioned to Mr. Emerson that he was interested in writing. How else do you explain this? Famously, what are you doing now, he asked. Do you keep a journal? So I make my first entry today. Wow, neither one of them understood the power of this exchange at the time. This encounter triggered a lot of writing, resulting not only in the books shown earlier, but also in a number of essays and poems and a journal of two million words that we still read and still quote from today. The journal also provided a starting point for many of those other writings. So not only do we have to thank Thoreau for all of this, we should also thank Mr. Emerson for prompting the practice in the first place. So thank you, Waldo. Now, I don't know if any aspiring writers ever approached Thoreau for writing advice. If someone had, he may very well have spouted off what he said in the first chapter of Walden. I would not have anyone adopt my mode of living on any account. I desire that there may be as many different persons in the world as possible, but I would have each one be very careful to find out and pursue his own way and not his father's or his mother's or his neighbor's instead. The youth may build or plant or sail, only let him not be hindered from doing that which he tells me he would like to do. And of course, for an aspiring author, this response just doesn't answer the question at all. Thoreau did leave occasional nuggets of writing wisdom, but they're not all in one place. And they're certainly not in just one essay, one letter, one lecture, or one book. We can gather up those pieces and add to them evidence in his own life and writings and come up with guidelines that he followed, maybe even automatically or unconsciously. And his examples can then provide us with motivation and inspiration. So what I've assembled are 10 guidelines for writers based on what Henry Thoreau said and did himself. And I'd like to make clear, as I always do with videos, that these are my own distillations and my own interpretations. Other folks, especially textual scholars, would probably have a few different ideas. Anyway, let's dive right in. Number one. Commit yourself to the task, take it seriously. Thoreau started writing in his journal on a regular basis. Eventually, it would become a daily habit. He committed himself to his writing as a young man, and then years later, he admitted this fact to himself. My work is writing, seems to say it all, and yet not. The whole quote is, my work is writing, and I do not hesitate 
though I know that no subject is too trivial for me, tried by ordinary standards. For ye fools, the theme is nothing, the life is everything. To Thoreau, writing was more meaningful than mere work. It was life itself. Aspiring writers may want to achieve that nirvana themselves. How can they do it? Well, the bottom line is, if you want to write, then you write. It's as simple as that. Or, as we sometimes say, it's as easy as B-I-C, but in chair. By the way, thanks to illustrator Mary Ann Orlando for allowing me to use her illustration of Henry at his desk, which we will see numerous times tonight. Thank you, Mary Ann. So, but in chair, and there's Henry. So how did he show his commitment besides with journal writing? Well, early on, he also wrote poetry and reviews and a few essays. Then in 1843, he made a bold and deliberate move to further his writing career. He left Concord and moved down to New York and to Staten Island. This was Mr. Emerson's idea. Here Thoreau could serve as a tutor for the William Emerson family, at the same time, he would be close to the big city publishers. Maybe he could foster and establish relationships with them. Maybe he would, could get something major published as a result. But no, Thoreau really didn't make it in New York. He had two of his smaller pieces printed in the Democratic Review, and that was only because of some reluctance on the part of his editor, John O'Sullivan. No. The best thing that came out of Thoreau's New York experience is that he met and befriended Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. Greeley would serve as an informal literary agent and as a sounding board for Thoreau from this point on. This was an excellent connection to make. In retrospect, we can understand why Henry would choose to move to New York and why Mr. Emerson would encourage him so heartily to do so. But really, what the relocation did was to take Henry absolutely away from the people and the place who inspired him the most. He was homesick down in New York, and homesickness was not the best trigger for his creativity. He stayed on Staten Island for just six months. When he returned to Concord, he was back for good. What Thoreau really wanted to do was to write a book about the boat trip that he and his brother John had taken in 1839 along the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. John was gone now, and Henry wanted to remember and honor his brother and their big adventure. How was he going to accomplish this? The question brings us to guideline number two. Discover your best practice. Each writer has to find out what circumstances work best for them. This includes location, time of day, the kinds of tools you'll be using, and how long and how often you'll write. Everybody's different, so finding out what somebody else does may not help you very much. A lot of people write in the morning. Some folks write in the middle of the night. Some authors write until they hit a certain word count for the day, like maybe 500 or 1,000 or more. Some will finish a certain number of pages. Some write until lunchtime and then they do something else in the afternoon. One thing is for sure, you have to write while the heat is in you. The writer who postpones the recording of his thoughts uses an iron which has cooled to burn a hole with. He cannot inflame the minds of his audience. Okay then, so how could Thoreau figure out the best circumstances for his writing progress process? How could he make sure he would be available when the fire ignited him? The Thoreau household was a busy one and his mother took in boarders, his maid Nance would come over to visit, and then there were always the abolitionist meetings and the petitions that the women in the family were always circulating. Busy, busy, busy. Henry needed to get away from all of that bustle but not too far away. He loved his family. That had been part of the problem with going off to Staten Island. It was too far away. Wouldn't you know it, Mr. Emerson offered the perfect solution. He owned a piece of land at Walden Pond, and he said that Henry could put up a small building there. Done. And so I see Thoreau's two years at Walden as an extended writer's retreat. He could determine the terms on his own. He could walk back home or do town errands as he needed to. 
and he could explore the nature that surrounded him. What a great gift from a friend, huh? So what did Thoreau land on as his process since he was given boundless time to figure it out? Well, evidence suggests that he often wrote in the mornings and then he used the afternoons to study nature or to do other tasks. At first, I thought the schedule was backward since he was so focused on nature, how could he not go out in the mornings when the birds are singing and the animals are more active? I mean, you know, today you, you go visit a zoo in the afternoon, the lions are all asleep, you know? I couldn't understand this decision until I considered it from a writer's perspective. If he wrote best in the morning, then the writing took priority. Nature would be waiting for him when he was done. And Thoreau most often paid attention to species in the plant wor world anyway, and not as many animals. Some flowers only bloom or open up when the sun shines on them. So, okay, now this makes sense. But it also shows again how committed Thoreau really was to his writing. And yes, some folks will say, but in the bean field chapter, Thoreau says that he hoed beans for hours upon hours every morning. Okay, sure. Maybe he did, but you know what? You can do a lot of thinking and writing in your head while your hands and body are doing something in a repetitive motion. And besides, was he really hoeing beans? What were the real fruits or vegetables of his labor? What kinds of seeds was Thoreau really sowing at Walden? Or was that all a metaphor for something else? Food for thought, <laughs> literally. Was Thoreau a planner or a pantser? As I said before, a planner is somebody who outlines everything ahead of time. A pantser is somebody who flies by the seat of his pants and goes with the flow of wherever the writing takes him. Well, he certain, certainly followed a structure for his first two books. A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers has chapters for the days of the week. Walden follows the season through the year from summer to spring. So everything for those books had to fit in that pattern. But certainly whenever he was studying nature, he had to be in the moment, watching whatever showed up in front of him. So he had to be ready to see anything and be inspired by anything. What I really think Thoreau was though, is a third kind of writer, which I like to call a puzzler or a piece worker, writing specific pieces that come to mind and then figuring out later where they fit into the grand scheme of the project, like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. And here, Thoreau used his journal as the puzzle box that held a lot of the pieces. You can read through his journal and you can find passages that sound somehow familiar. And you may say to yourself, wait a minute, haven't I read this before? Where did I read it? Here's an example, a long one I won't won't uh, read out loud, but uh, you probably recognize it. It's a journal excerpt from 1850, which eventually showed up in the formal publication of the essay Walking. It's the part about not being able to easily shake off the village from time to time in your head. And that's just one example. You can find many more examples like that. Any, uh, anyway, it's the way, one of the ways Thoreau used his journal as a, a holding pattern for things that he could use in other places. Now, once you've figured out your process as a writer and you're confident in moving forward with it, what do you do? You move forward. If Thoreau went to Walden to write and to figure out how to do it, then once he mastered the craft, he could leave his self-imposed retreat. Now he could transfer his skills and that practice to wherever he happened to be. But before we leave Walden, let's go back to the house and explore something that Robert Thorson brings up in his book, A Guide to Walden Pond. Thank you, Thor. Thor is the first person I know who wonders in print why Thoreau built his house exactly where he did and at the exact angle that he did, because it couldn't have been for the spacious, spacious views, there aren't any. When you're at the side of the cabin and you sit in the doorway, you can barely see the pond because of the slope of the landscape. 
These trees are too young to have been standing when Henry was here in the 1840s. A few pines and oaks would have been here, but not too many. Still, you can't really see the pond that well. And there's no crushed gravel path back in his day either. That's brand new. Inside the cabin, Henry's green desk stood beneath one of the windows. I don't think we know which side it was on, whether it was on the left side of the house or the right side of the house. Almost doesn't matter because you don't get a water view either way. From the window facing northeast, all you see is land and trees. From the window facing southwest, all you see is land and trees. Which means that Henry has no view of the pond from inside his house if he has the door closed. Kind of makes you wonder, get this folks, if this is why the book is called Walden or Life in the Woods, because he was obviously in the woods at that point, more than he was actually at the pond. How about that? And yet, he found a way to write about water here. He found a way to write about the trip that he and John took as they paddled along the two rivers. Just goes to show that if you have good notes and a good memory and imagination, you can write about something anywhere. And being in such a small and confined space may have been good preparation for Thoreau when his family moved a few years later to the Yellow House on Main Street. Henry's room was in the attic under the sloped roof with a small window at either end of the space. The house faces the Sudbury River, but Henry couldn't see the water from his room. And yet he finished writing Walden here. You just don't have to be at a certain place to write about it. You, you don't, in fact, I think it's an advantage if you're not in the place that you're writing about and you let your imagination take over. This also reminds me of the way that Nathaniel Hawthorne used to write. If you visit the Old Manse or the Wayside in Concord, Old Manse is on top there, Wayside's on the bottom, then you can see his writing tables angled down from the walls. He stood up to write with his back to the window so he couldn't be distracted by looking outside. Yes, writers will tell you that distractions can be a real problem for concentration, especially with email and juicy tidbits on the internet calling your name from your computer. These guys didn't have to deal with any of that, obviously, but they did face the same kinds of uncertainties that all writers face. It's the am I good enough or imposter syndrome. Don't worry, Henry, it's still early for you. It'll get better with time and practice, I promise, because you've got a great foundation beneath you because you know the language. And this goes beyond knowledge of the basics of grammar and punctuation and how to achieve subject verb agreement. It goes beyond knowing dictionary definitions. It's knowing how to put words together in compelling ways, in descriptive ways, and in ways that the readers may not have expected or even imagined. Thoreau uses wordplay a lot. As a simple example, here's something he wrote to his Worcester friend, Harrison Gray Otis Blake. On this date, May 3rd, 1861, exactly 161 years ago today. The doctor accordingly tells me that I must clear out to the West Indies or elsewhere, he does not seem to care much where. Now, maybe the doctor used that exact phrase, maybe he didn't, but I can tell you that just about any time Thoreau uses quote marks, he is quoting someone directly. So maybe the doctor did say clear out, and maybe he meant it in one specific way, because at this time, Thoreau was suffering from consumption, tuberculosis, and because nobody knew the cause or the cure for consumption, doctors recommended travel to a different climate so that the patient could breathe better air. So here, clear out can really have two separate and different meanings. Thoreau can clear out his lungs by clearing out to the American Midwest. Isn't that cool? I mean, I'm sorry, you're sick, Henry. But even while his health isn't terrific, he's making inside jokes with a friend by deliberately using wordplay. Here's an example that was just posted a few days ago on the 
Thoreau Journal Facebook group page, which I highly recommend, the Thoreau Journal Facebook group page. I approach a great nature with infinite expectation and uncertainty, not knowing what I may meet. It lies as broad and unexplored before me as a scraggy hillside or pasture. I may hear a fox bark or a partridge drum or some bird new to these localities may fly up. It lies out there as old and yet as new. The aspect of the woods varies every day, what with their growth and the changes of the seasons and the influence of the elements so that the eye of the forester never twice rests upon the same prospect. Much more does a character show newly and varied, if directly seen. An interesting passage, and one of the first commenters on it was Jeff Wisner, who said, it doesn't become clear until the end of this excerpt, but when Thoreau says he approaches a great nature, he means a person's character. Thank you, Jeff. Yes. The beginning of this paragraph is, I approach a great nature with infinite expectation and uncertainty, not knowing what I may meet. Here, a great nature can be interpreted in two different ways. At first, it seems as though he's describing what he sees in a wider landscape. But when you hit the word character in the last sentence, then the whole paragraph takes on a different view. It's a long metaphor or a simile or both. I always forget. I get them mixed up. We'll talk about them in a couple more minutes. In any case, this is one of those times when you may want to read the whole thing again to make sure you understand exactly what Thoreau means if you can figure out what he means. And is he describing his own character or somebody else's? That's open to debate. So watch for wordplay in his writing. He uses it a lot. And I wonder if he got great glee out of finding those perfect words that have dual meanings that could both interest and puzzle the reader at the same time. I hope he did get happiness from that. I didn't understand the breadth of Thoreau's abilities as a creative writer until I met a translator from another country. A couple of years ago, I gave a Concord and Walden tour to a man who planned to create a new translation of Walden in his native language. He said that the existing one was too scholarly and he wanted to create one that would be more accessible to the general population. That sounded like a good idea to me. So I showed him around Concord and around Walden and we had a good time and then he went home and I started getting emails from him. What does this sentence mean? He would ask, what does this sentence mean? Now, he knew English pretty well, and he even had studied at a college in the United States. When I went back to look at the passages he was having trouble with, I suddenly could see the challenge. Just about any one of Thoreau's sentences, you can read and interpret in a number of different ways, especially when he's deliberately using words with multiple meanings. So you could read the sentence and sometimes come up with two completely opposite interpretations. And it dawned on me what a huge challenge translators must face. How can they ever put as much nuance into their sentences as Thoreau did in his? I don't know how they can do it. Obviously they have. Here's a Walden in French, in Chinese, and in German. And there are many more. But in the end, I don't even know if that man finished his project. Maybe it was too tough a task, which again is actually a credit to Thoreau's finesse as a creative writer. Number four, be curious, be observant, everything is material. Obviously Thoreau was an ultra observant person and he wondered about things that he saw. When you read his journal, you can see that he asks questions of himself in there. What is this? Why is that? And really, any writer needs to be both curious and observant because only then can you creatively weave that curiosity and those observations into pieces of writing. Doesn't matter whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction. I myself once wrote a series of haiku about a woolly bear caterpillar that I followed one day as it ambled across a grassy lawn. So it can be done. Not to, but to be curious and observant 
goes beyond just what you encounter out in the real world or out in nature. You should also read widely, especially in the genre that you want to write in. Learn new information about people, places, and things that you never thought of before. See the kinds of stylings that other writers use to convey their stories. And do your own research, too, if your writing warrants it. As we know, Thoreau read a lot, especially a lot of travel narratives, which was a good idea since that's the kind of writing that he did. Even the book Walden can be considered to be a travel narrative. Thoreau had his own sizable library and he also borrowed books from Emerson and from the libraries at Harvard and in Boston. When he wanted to write about a place that he had visited, he researched its history and its background either before or after his visit. You can see evidence of this in his Cape Cod essays and in A Yankee in Canada, as well as in other pieces. He took notes and he wrote down direct quotes, sometimes filling up special notebooks for them so that he could call on those resources and add them to his writings about his own experiences. And of course, after you look at something for yourself and you find background information to help flesh out the details, you've got to think. Think of how it all fits together somehow in a way maybe that no one else has thought of before. Here's one of my favorite Thoreau examples that follows this advice. Grasshoppers have been very abundant in dry fields for two or three weeks. Sophia worked, walked through the depot field a fortnight ago, and when she got home, picked 50 or 60 from her skirts for she wore hoops and crinoline. Would not this be a good way to clear a field of them, to send a bevy of fashionably dressed women across a field? and leave them to clean their skirts when they get home. <laughs> That's a terrific idea, Henry. Now he's really thinking, isn't he? And he's bringing humor into what could have been a serious scene too. It probably was serious for Sophia at first, although maybe it became funnier as she went along. Henry was a funny guy and sometimes people forget this. Of course, he could also be a serious observer and thinker too. He could walk along the main street of Concord and witness something else entirely. And then he could think about that and write more on that theme. Number five, tell a good story, engage your audience. Think about why people pick up a book in the first place. They're curious. They're intrigued by your title first and by your subject matter soon afterward. And they probably want to find a connection with you or with the text somehow. Is this something that they have experience with too? Or is it something that they'd like to do someday? Or do they know someone else who's done it? Readers have many aware of themselves. I do think they are looking for connections though. So don't be afraid to put yourself or some version of yourself into your work. Make it personal. Thoreau does this with the opening sentence of Walden. When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, and earned my living by the labor of my hands only. Now, wow, it's a lot of information in just one sentence, isn't it? Don't you want to naturally know the rest of the story? Why did this person go to this place? What is this place? What did this guy do there? If he's writing this text after the fact, then why did he leave? Thoreau spends the next couple hundred pages answering all of those questions. And of course, he adds a lot more to that mix too. So make your writing personal. And then you can also use certain literary devices to make more connections. Thoreau is a master at this craft. Among the techniques he uses are wordplay, metaphors, similes, analogies, hyperbole, cultural references, literary references, and humor, often directing it at himself. Now, if it's been a while since you took a literature class, I've added some basic definitions here. As I said, I always forget the difference between a metaphor and a simile. A simile is the one that uses as or like. 
in the comparison. But humor, 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 don't forget humor. As I said, Henry was a funny guy. Now, you can open up Walden or A Week or any one of Thoreau's essays and find multiple examples of these techniques printed on any, any page. I have picked out just a few. This is from the sounds chapter of Walden. Now, Thoreau certainly wasn't the first person to compare a train with horses or to call a locomotive an iron horse, but he sure could embellish upon this comparison. When I hear the iron horse make the hills echo with his snort-like thunder, shaking the earth with his feet and breathing fire and smoke from his nostrils, it seems as if the earth had got a race now worthy to inhabit it. Wow. You know, back in the day, Thoreau's readers could really appreciate this description. They knew horses. They'd known horses all their lives. It was the arrival of the train that was new to them. And it was noisy and loud. And at first it was seen as a real intrusion into their neighborhoods and it spewed its black smoke everywhere. So he plays on this fact, but at the same time, he admires the train for its energy. And once he starts seeing the similarities, he can't stop writing about them. The stabler of the iron horse was up early this winter morning by the light of the stars amid the mountains to fodder and harness his steed. Fire too was awakened thus early to put the vital heat in him and get him off. If the snow lies deep, they strap on his snowshoes and with the giant plow, plow a furrow from the mountains to the seaboard in which the cars, like a following drill barrow, sprinkle all the restless men and floating merchandise in the country for seed. All day, the fire steed flies over the country, stopping only that his master may rest. Now here, Thoreau's also playing on the fact that his audience knows agriculture. They know about plowing and about casting seeds upon the land. And his readers will say, yep, that's exactly what it does. He got it right. Here's an example of a literary reference that he throws into a story. This is from the essay, Wild Apples, where he tells the tale of going to Minnesota and seeing crab apple trees along the way from the train windows. I never saw the crab apple till May, 1861. At last I had occasion to go to Minnesota and on entering Michigan, I began to notice from the cars, a tree with handsome rose colored flowers. At first I thought it's some variety of thorn, but it was not long before the truth flashed on me that this was my long sought crab apple. But cars never stopped before one. And so I was launched on the bosom of the Mississippi without having touched one, experiencing the fate of Tantalus. Okay, guys, who was Tantalus? Do you know your Greek mythology? Tantalus killed his son and for his crime, he was punished by being forced to stand up in water that came up to his chin. When he tried to drink the water, it would recede. Fruits and grapes hung over his head, but when he tried to reach for them to eat them, they would blow out of his way. So the poor guy was surrounded by food and water and couldn't access any of it. It's a terrible fate. And we get the word tantalize from his dire situation. Thoreau is using this analogy here to compare how he felt with not being able to reach the blossoms of the crab apple trees in Michigan. Is this as crucial a fate as not being able to reach life sustaining elements? Of course not, of course not. This is a similar but really crazy analogy and savvy readers will understand how nutty this is and they'll probably laugh. Thoreau is using mythology and hyperbole and humor all at the same time in order to emphasize the importance of crab trees to himself, at least from his perspective. And he does that all by referencing just one recognizable name. It's actually an amazing bit of creative writing. Let's go back to that earlier quote where he said that his work was writing. What I didn't include then was the rest of the journal passage. All that interests the reader is the depth and intensity of the life excited. Thoreau knew how to engage his audiences and how important it was to do this. He knew they wanted to find connections and excitement 
and the ability to get his inside jokes. And so that's what he gave to them. That's how he wrote. Number six, go for a walk. You can't write all day long. You just can't, at least not usually. Eventually the creative river dwindles down to a mere trickle. So when your writing session is over, however you define it by time or by production or by exhaustion, then you need to get away from it. Stand up, yawn, stretch, go for a walk. You know Thoreau did this. I think that I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least, and it is commonly more than that, sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. Now, of course, while he was walking, he was also checking out all the plants and animal signs along the way, perhaps taking notes on them in his field notebook, but that's a different set of skills than the ones you use in the sessions of creative writing. So this kind of activity has the result in a way of cleansing the palate. Do something different. There's a lot of research on the benefits of walking daily. I don't have to repeat it here, you guys know it. You know that the act of walking has recuperative and restorative properties. Going out, of, going out into nature does. Plus, you get to see things. Don't forget to be curious and observant at the same time while you're out there. And when you get back, you'll be able to approach your writing with a fresh eye. You'll see things in your senses that you didn't see before. And it'll turn out that your brain had been working on your writing in the background all along while you were out walking. And something that before, may have been seen as an insurmountable obstacle, will suddenly have a logical solution. It's true. This is how our imaginations work. It can feel like magic. I hope that Henry sometimes had a chance to feel that magic. Number seven, read your work aloud. To yourself, a lot. To other people, if you want to. This is the only way to hear how the words flow and to find out if your word choices feel right and natural. Because when readers read, what they're really doing is quietly reciting your text in their heads, reading your sentences and paragraphs to themselves. If they land upon a word that they don't know or that doesn't seem to fit, then they'll have to stop for a moment and go a bit slower. And you don't want them to have to do that. You want them to have a continuous and joyous reading experience. One of my pet peeves is to go to a conference and to hear someone read a paper and you know that they wrote the paper and you know that they know the subject that they're talking about, but when they read their work out loud, they stumble on some of the phrases. Now, this is a red flag for me. Sure, the presenter might just be nervous. I understand that, but my immediate reaction is, ah, you didn't read your paper out loud. Otherwise, you maybe would have worded that phrase differently or said it in a totally different way. Full disclosure here, I wrote a script for this program as I always do, and I have read it to myself out loud over and over and over again before we started here this evening. My cat at home can, can, can verify this with you. So if I have stumbled here tonight, that's just because my mouth is trying to catch up with my brain. So that's my disclaimer for tonight. Now, I don't think we know if Thoreau read his work out loud to himself as he was writing. He did lecture. He gave about 75 lectures during his lifetime, traveling as far south as Philadelphia and as far north as Portland, Maine. And he didn't really like the experience. I think he felt obligated to do it following in Emerson's footsteps and at the great man's prodding except for his lectures about the fate of John Brown, which he absolutely felt passionate about. I think Thoreau was a reluctant lecturer. I think he may have had different reasons for speaking than Emerson and Bronson Alcott did. Both of them left for speaking tours in order to get money to support their households and to promote themselves and their work. Thoreau wasn't very promotion oriented. And although he didn't say this anywhere, Maybe we should consider that he read his work in public more for himself than for the audience. What he, 
What he read to them became portions of Walden and a number of his essays like Resistance to Civil Government and the pieces about Cape Cod, Maine, and Quebec. And maybe he could get a bit of reaction from the audiences. You know, lectures back then were just papers that were read. No response from the audience was required or expected. No Q&A sessions were held afterwards. No VIP backstage passes were judiciously handed out in order that a few select fans could meet and greet the esteemed speaker. No, you read their work, your work. They applauded, hopefully. You picked up a check or an envelope with cash in it, hopefully. And then you went back home, boom. Just after Walden was published in the fall of 1854, Thoreau gave lectures in Philadelphia and in Providence, Rhode Island. And afterward, he admitted to himself in his journal how he felt about the whole deal. After lecturing twice this winter, I feel that I am in danger of cheapening myself by trying to become a successful lecturer, i.e. to interest my audiences. I am disappointed to find that most that I am and value myself for is lost or worse than lost on my audience. I fail to get even the attention of the mass. I should suit them better if I suited myself less. I would rather that my audience come to me than that I should go to them. And so they'd be sifted, i.e. I would rather write books than lectures. That is fine, this course. To read to a promiscuous audience who are at your mercy, the fine thoughts you solaced yourself with far away is as violent as to fatten geese by cramming. And in this case, they do not get fatter. Oh, Henry, I'm so sorry for your bad experiences. On the brighter side though, you did get to hear your words for yourself. And maybe you changed some of your phrases as a result. By the way, thanks to colleague Richard Smith for use of his photos. Number eight, be patient for results within reason. Now, what am I referring to when I talk about patience? Well, part of it has to do with your writing process. Sometimes so many possibilities pop up that it can be tough to figure out what your project priorities are. It is wise to write on many subjects, to try many themes, so that you may find the right and inspiring one. You must try a thousand themes before you find the right one, as nature makes a thousand acorns to get one oak. So you'll have to be patient to find those worthy themes. I should, um, it's the, <laughs> uh, I have to, I have to uh, give a shout out here to my fellow colleagues at Walden Pond for supplying me with an excellent acorn pitcher. It is the wrong season to get an acorn pitcher out in the woods right now. And they had a great one. So thank you, Jen and Jackie. Um, anyway, be patient in finding your direction. You know, Thoreau did a whole lot of research on English poets at the beginning of his writing career. And he abandoned that project without using much of the information that he had assembled, which in retrospect was probably a good decision on his part. Uh, we would not be wanting to read about English poets, probably, Henry. And then be patient with refining your work. The act of editing can be a challenging, but again, rewarding experience. Thoreau says, I find that I use many words for the sake of emphasis, which really add nothing to the force of my sentences. And they look relieved the moment I have canceled these. Editing can be a tough challenge. Uh, I, I, it, it gets better as you go along, Henry. It gets better as you go along. Success and sales and fame come quickly for just a few select authors. For the rest of us, those fringe benefits come slowly if they ever come at all. And unfortunately, Thoreau learned this lesson the hard way when his first book, a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, the book he went to Walden to write, the book about his, he and his brother John going up the rivers, didn't sell very well. He'd spent money to get it printed himself, and then out of the initial run of a thousand copies, fewer than 300 were sold or were somehow given away. And then Thoreau had to figure out what to do with the rest of them. He tells this sad story in a lengthy journal entry. 
For a year or two past, my publisher, falsely so-called, has been writing from time to time to ask what dispositions should be made of the copies of A Week on the Concord and Merrimack River still on hand, and at last suggesting that he had use for the room they occupied in his cellar. So I had them all sent to me here, and they have arrived today by express, filling the man's wagon, 706 copies out of an edition of 1,000, which I bought of Monroe four years ago and have been ever since paying for and have not quite paid for yet. The wares are sent to me at last, and I have an opportunity to examine my purchase. They are something more substantial than fame as my back nose, which has borne them up two flights of stairs to a place similar to that to which they trace their origin. Now, interruption here. See, he's equating the yellow house attic with the Walden house in terms of size. Of the remaining 290 odd, 75 were given away, the rest sold. I have now a library of nearly 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. This last sentence is the one we hear most often, and it's, it's quintessential Thoreau, isn't it? Again, he's using hyperbole and humor, this time to make the best out of a bad situation. And when we tell this story to other people, this is usually where we all end it. I have now a library of nearly 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. <laughs> funny. Everybody laughs because it's funny. Henry's a funny guy. But this isn't the ending of the story for Henry. He keeps on going. Is it not well that the author should behold the fruits of his labor? My works are piled up on one side of my chamber, half as high as my head, my opera omnia. This is authorship. These are the work of my brain. I can see now what I write for, the results of my labor. Nevertheless, in spite of this result, sitting beside the inert mass of my works, I take up my pen tonight to record what thought or experience I may have had with as much satisfaction as ever. Indeed, I believe that this result is more inspiring and better for me than if a thousand had bought my wares. It affects my privacy less and leaves me freer. Wow. More power to you, Henry. I don't think I could have done that. To be unduly inspired by what was filling up those boxes, I, I just don't think I would have felt the same way. You hear about writers getting rejection letters after rejection letters after rejection letters from publishers and agents, and then they tack the rejection letters up on the walls so they can be inspired to become more successful. Actually, I tried that myself some years ago, and somewhere between the 50th and the 100th letter, I got depressed. I took them all down, and I put them in a folder and in a cabinet and out of my sight. They were just too, too depressing to look at. They did not inspire me at all, at all. Remember, Henry was up in that attic room with all of those boxes. I have been inside the yellow house, which is privately owned, by the way, and I never made it up to the attic. But someone who did told me that it was very claustrophobic up there. And that was when he didn't see a stash of manuscript boxes sitting around. I can't, I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. As for Henry, he had no idea that someday, 53 years later, his opera Omnia, his collected works, would take a different form and would look a lot better and in a more concise space. And it would include 14 volumes of his precious journal. Number nine, assemble a supportive network. Writers work alone and by themselves, but they do need other people. They need folks who believe in what they're doing and who will support them, even if they're not writers themselves. I'm sure you know that Henry had a supportive family and that he was close to them. Here are their photographs as you see them in the room I'm sitting in right now, the bedroom of the Thoreau Farm birthplace on Virginia Road in Concord. We have only a silhouette of his mother up on top there, Cynthia Dunbar Thoreau, Henry's mother. And then his father, John, is to the right of her above. And then below are the four children in birth order from left to right, Helen, John, Henry, and Sophia. 
No, it's too bad that Helen and John didn't live to see their brother's work get published. His parents did, and his younger sister, Sophia, did. In fact, she became even more instrumental in his writing and his publishing projects. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Thoreau also found some good friends among some of the people who started writing to him after they read and were impressed by his books. This is how he found friends and good correspondents in H.G.O. Blake from Worcester and Daniel Rickardson from New Bedford, Massachusetts. They were admirers who shared common interests and who supported just about any writing or speaking project Henry happened to make. They also both arranged for Henry to lecture in their cities. But of course, it's always good to, for a writer to be able to network with other writers. You know what's coming, right? You have to have someone to bounce ideas off and to have people who know what it's like to be a creative person. And of course, Henry had these connections too in Concord. First with Ralph Waldo Emerson, with Margaret Fuller, especially when she was the editor of The Dial. Friend and poet Ellery Channing was not only a fellow transcendentalist, but also a walking and traveling companion for Henry. And Bronson Alcott was an admirer and a friend who eventually moved his family to Concord to be closer to all the rest of them. He is a great example, Bronson is. Here's a friend who, as soon as your second book comes out, sits down and reads it not only once, but a couple of times, goes back and reads your first book too, and realizes how talented a writer you are, and he predicts your future. What a friend and a fellow writer Bronson Alcott was. How lucky Henry was to be part of this creative community. Today, if you don't have many people around you who understand you and who support your work, you can find writing communities online that can stand in and serve the purpose pretty well. People often wonder and ask what it was about Concord, Massachusetts that made it so special. How could all of these writers be living in the same place at the same time? Well, duh, they were around each other because they almost needed to be. They could inspire one another and they could comment and analyze and criticize each other's work if they needed to. They could share speaking venue information and publishing information. Writers write on their own, but they still need sounding boards and connections to other creative people who will know what they're going through. They need people who they don't have to explain the process to. If you're a writer, you should figure out who the key members of your network are. They may not be obvious at first. They may not be your closest family or your closest friends. Gradually, you'll discover who your best first readers are. And you'll also identify people whom you should never give another piece of your writing to. Believe me. Which brings us to our 10th and final guideline, which is commit yourself to the task, take it seriously, persevere. I'm repeating this advice because it deserves repeating. And because once again, Henry serves as a prime example of commitment to writing. Maybe he really was inspired by being surrounded by all of those boxes of the unsold copies of a week. Maybe that's one reason why he worked so diligently on his Walden manuscript. Maybe he realized that he didn't have any more room in that attic for any more remainder boxes. What could he do to make sure the same thing didn't happen twice? Well, he could make sure that this new manuscript was the best one it could possibly be. And if that meant writing out by hand seven different drafts of it, then so be it. Can you even imagine the work that was involved in doing this? Writing out with pen and ink a full manuscript seven times over. Just for this act alone, Thoreau deserves to win some kind of creating writing medal, don't you think? Naturally, now that we can digitize everything today, you can see for yourself, if you want to, the slight variations between each copy of Thoreau's seven drafts of Walden. Just digit, visit digitalthoreau.org, look for the Walden Manuscript Project, courtesy of the State University of New York. Thank you, guys. This time, his hard work didn't pay off. 
and Walden did sell better than a week had. The first run of 2000 copies sold out and Tickner and Fields was due to release a second edition of the book soon. Even better, the publisher agreed to take the old pages of a week and rebind them and sell them too. So if you can find a copy of a week that is a first edition, second printing released by Tickner and Fields, then you know that its pages once slept in the same attic room that Thoreau did. There's a treasure hunt assignment for you. So all was going pretty well for our, our favorite writer now, right? Everything was going splendidly. Well, no. Now Thoreau's health was really suffering and it was obvious that his time was limited. So he and his sister Sophia spent those last months in the family home, the yellow house, probably in the living room or the dining room, preparing his remaining manuscripts for publication for what would turn in out to be posthumous publication. Thanks to Sophia's efforts with some help from Ellery Channing, more of Henry's books appeared on the scene after he was gone. Excursions, The Maine Woods, Cape Cod, Yankee in Canada. Some of Henry's best essays were printed in the Atlantic Monthly too. And of course, a second edition of Walden, now with a simplified one word title that will forever be linked with the man who made it famous, both the place and the book. Yes. Henry David Thoreau's life was all too short, but it certainly was a creative life. And I think that by now you will agree that it was a creatively committed life too. So in summary, here are all 10 guidelines again, based on Thoreau's practices for your convenience. Hey, you know, if you wanna take a screenshot of this screen and save it for future reference, have at it. I don't mind. So writers out there, find your own practice, your own process, make it work. Be curious and be observant. Read your work out loud. Surround yourself with good connections. The bottom line though is if you wanna be a writer, then be one, write. Be committed to the task. We have a lot to learn from Henry David Thoreau about commitment to writing. And if you're a writer, and you haven't read any Thoreau lately, uh, that's okay. You've got time. Pick up something soon. Doesn't even matter what it is, although I would recommend other, I, I would probably recommend the complete books like Walden or A Week or some essays. Don't just read a book of quotes. Don't just read random quotes because with random quotes, you never know the context of where they're coming from. And read Thoreau as a writer. Forget about content temporarily. Watch how he writes and how he uses those techniques and those literary devices to make connections with the readers so that he can prompt his audiences to say to themselves, oh, wow, we get that, we get it. And then when you're done reading, go for a walk. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Thoreau Farm and the Thoreau Society. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Kareem, for distilling Thoreau into um, such a great set. I love a good list. And I think this one really strikes me as something that works not only for writing, but for other endeavors, you know, various professions, but also things like nurturing a friendship or parenting my kids or pursuing hobbies. I think go for a walk works for a lot of those in particular. Um, before we get into some of these questions, we have a proposed additional guideline that came in. I wonder if you can weigh in on whether it works. Happy to. It, it is write what you care about. And the quote from Henry says, my journal should be the record of my love. I would write in it only of the things I love, my affection for any aspect of the world, what I love to think of. Who sent that one in? Uh, Jeff Wisner. Hey, Jeff, thanks a lot. Do you like that as an addition? Do we go like with it. 11 guidelines now? <laughs> yes. It's not as tidy a list, but it might be useful. <laughs> 
By the way, I'm I'm seeing chat now. Hi, Dale. I see you. <laughs> okay. Um, let, so, me, let me. I just I just talked for a whole long time. Let me get a drink. Get a drink. Get a drink and ruminate on um, whether you think Thoreau forced himself not to write more often than he forced himself to write. Wow. First of all, how would we even know that? <laughs> you know, um, we all make choices, you know, and uh, there probably were times in his life, I'm just assuming, I'm just projecting 21st century viewpoints on a 19th century person, but I'll bet you there were times when he had surveying jobs, when he knew he really wanted to do those surveying jobs and do it, but, um, probably had an inclination to write. What, I'm on there. Uh, probably had an inclination to write and didn't have the time to or opportunity to then, uh, which would have been too bad. Um, see, the more you think about that stuff though, the more you think, what did we lose if he didn't write when he <laughs> wanted to? No, maybe we don't wanna think about <laughs> what we lost. I mean, you know, if he hadn't died at 44, what else would we have? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's that kind of stuff, you know, and um, a good question, food for thought. We can debate that sometime. We also got the question regarding your, your guideline, know the language. How helpful do you think it was for Thoreau that he knew Latin and Greek and French? He threw that stuff in there all the time, you know, um, and I think, um, a lot of that was self-taught. Uh, I mean, yeah, he went to Harvard and he has a Harvard degree, uh, even if he didn't pay, pick up the paperwork for it, whatever that story is. Um, but he read so much on his own. But, you know, a lot of people back then were reading the Greek and were reading, you know, <laughs> we're reading a lot more languages than we do today. Um, it certainly broadens your horizons. Uh, as far as the French goes, it, I, can, I can tell you that it didn't help him very much in Quebec because the rural people living in Quebec didn't speak the same kind of French that he probably was taught at Harvard. And I don't even know if, if Harvard taught speaking and maybe they just taught reading French, which if, if you read French, that's one thing. I'm taking French right now, so I understand this. <laughs> <laughs> this pretty well. And my final is on Monday. Um, uh, reading French is nothing like speaking it. You don't, you don't pronounce most of the consonants. <laughs> I mean, it's so confusing. Uh, I think it helped a lot. And I think, again, it's one of those inside jokes that if other people knew those languages, they'd understand it because he didn't just go back and translate. I mean, he just let it go. It's, it's up to the annotators of Walden and, and the others to, to throw in there what that really means. So I think it was a, an, uh, a nice supplement, a nice augmentation. Thinking of Thoreau as a reader, who were some of his favorite writers and did he emulate them closely or deliberately avoid doing that? Uh, wow. Is there any evidence of influence that can be found in his writings? I'm probably not the person to find <laughs> to comment on that. I'll bet there are textual scholars out there who can uh, can figure that out. Um, he didn't read fiction, uh, so that's not you know what he did. But you know, uh, reading travel narratives, you just go back and and you see who those people were back in the day. Harriet Martineau was one of them, and I'm pretty sure he read her. Uh, I don't. I don't know that he emulated. I don't know the answer to that question, guys. Uh, somebody else probably does. Um, I haven't done all the comparison, but if you want to do a comparison, don't forget about Bob Saddle, Bob Saddlemeyer's book, uh, The Rose Reading, which is a bibliography of all the books that Thoreau references in all of his works, and it gives you the citation of where he got them, uh, whether it was from his own library or Harvard or Emerson or somewhere else. Um, that's a good resource, but there's a good dissertation for somebody to take on. <laughs> was he influenced by the people that he read? Um, do you think he was influenced by Emerson's writing style? I don't know about that. Or Bronson Alcott's? I don't know about that. Or Ellery Channing's? Probably not. 
I don't know. Influenced perhaps by some of their thinking, but not by their writing. Good idea. <laughs> Are there occasions when Thoreau demonstrates really straying from these guidelines you've sort of distilled from his practice? Does he show impatience? Does he demonstrate overt disinterest in a topic uh, to the detriment of his writing, perhaps? Whoa, you guys are asking complex questions. I don't know the answer to that either. Although one thing that uh, I thought somebody would catch me on maybe or, uh, or uh, confront me on politely uh, <laughs> is the uh, writing in the morning thing. Um, because we, he does have times where he says, you know, I went out this morning and I did da 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 da. Or he walks at night and, you know, he does that. Um, and so I thought maybe somebody would, would say, and then that's why I put in the bean field thing, because I know it says that he, he worked in the bean field. Um, I'm sure his schedule, since he was self-employed, <laughs> I'm sure his schedule was pretty fluid. Uh, but I'll bet if he knew that certain things were blooming or, uh, that he wanted to see a certain thing happening in Concord, that he was sure to get out there and see it. Um, and again, with the right, the right, while the fire is in you, I'm sure that when he got an idea, uh, he would scribble it down in his notebook. I wish I could have found that, that one. And we've got some savvy viewers on here. Somebody's going to know this. Where did he say, I don't think it's in walking, it might be in the journal. Where did he kind of diss Ellery for not being able to, to take good notes on walks? Does anybody know that? Because uh, I'm pretty sure somewhere he's, he's, he's talking about his companion, but of course he doesn't name Ellery, he just says C. Uh, <laughs> and, he, and he says, you know, C doesn't, doesn't take good notes while we're writing. Uh, if somebody knows that, let me know, let me know. Or you find it somewhere down the line, write to me and tell me that. I'm easy to find online. <laughs> or at the shop. Call me at the shop and tell me where that quote is because I, I, I think he said that sometime about Ellery, which is too bad, um, but. Uh, While so we're I don't waiting have... for one of our, one of our great uh, participants to find us that answer, um, there's a question about some of Thoreau's other friends. It asks, while his supportive network included Emerson and Fuller, and that clearly affected his thinking, how much do you think Thoreau really needed and enjoyed being a mentor for correspondents like Blake? I think he, I think he liked Blake um, a lot. I mean, why else would he go to Worcester like 12 times? Uh, I think Blake and Brown in Worcester, H.T.O. Uh, Blake and Theo Brown in Worcester, um, were some of his closest friends. And when he was sick at the end, they walked here from Worcester. It took them two days. Um, and he traveled with Blake at least once uh, when they went up Wachusett, when he went up Wachusett the second time he was with Blake. I think he enjoyed them. Uh, I think it might have been nice for him to have the distance and that they weren't necessarily in Concord. Um, they were a train ride away, pretty short train ride away, about two hours, hour and a half, two hours. Uh, you know, he was, I, I equate this with when Calvin Green of Michigan was writing to Thoreau. And you guys know that story, right? Calvin Green was this big fan of his in Michigan. And Calvin Green's the one who wrote to him in said, I'd, I'd really like to meet you or I'd really like to have you a picture. I'm paraphrasing. And uh, Henry said, you have the best of me in my books. I'm not worthy to look at, although he says it something better than that. But, and yet Thoreau goes to the Daguerrean Palace in Worcester the next time he's in Worcester again. So three, three images taken, sends one to Calvin Green, gives the other two to Blake and Brown. And that's the famous 1856 Maxim Daguerreotype that we have. I think Calvin Green, Calvin Green kept writing to him and was really exuberant. And I think Thoreau was really put off by that. And I think he, he saw Blake and Brown and Ricketson of New Bedford as much more stable correspondence compared to this guy who was really asking for a lot and really wanted to meet him. Because um, when Thoreau went through, to, through Michigan to go to Minnesota, he did not stop at Calvin Green's house. 
uh, I don't think he would have even considered it. Um, so I think, I think it was great to have some of those um, correspondence and, and all three of them, all three of those men were writers or, or intellectuals, even if they weren't fully educated to be intellectuals. Um, Blake was a teacher. I don't know what his educational background was. Theo Brown was a tailor, ran his own tailoring business on the main street of, of Worcester. Daniel Rickinson was a Quaker and uh, eventually wrote a history of the city of New Bedford. So I think they all had qualities that he could tap into occasionally. But I think, again, it was nice that they were distant. A, a train right away, not too far, but not right here. <laughs> not close right enough to bring him right to bear out that relationship. Um, our chat has come through and, and they unanimously say it's from the journal. And we even have the date, November 9th, 1851. And it says, in our walks, C takes out his notebook sometimes and tries to write as I do, but all in vain. And how so, did you find that? <laughs> Who found that and how did they find it? That's what I want so to know. So it came from Jeff Wisner. Oh, Jeff, you know everything. <laughs> and a number of other people chimed in to identify that it was the journal. They just weren't as <laughs> quick at the draw for the date. Yeah, um, and I also I, I come through walking and I knew it wasn't in walking because he probably wouldn't have put that in a formal essay like that, you know, because uh, he was probably just saying that to himself in his journal. But it's cool that we get to hear it now. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, for checking it out. Thank you, Jeff. I owe you. Um, and I he, he says here that he did a quick search in the PDF of the journal. So it wasn't oh. stored in his mind, but he had the tools at hand. Uh, and I, I just want to take a minute before we wrap up and echo some of the comments that are coming through in the chat and just say thank you for giving us such a wonderful, detailed human view of Henry as a writer and, and sort of walking us through all these various things and giving us a great concrete list that we can, we can take with us onto our next tasks. So thank you for that. And if and thank you all for joining us on Zoom. This has been really wonderful. Thank you for your questions and your engagement. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or you want to watch it again, which I'm sure some of you do, or you're interested in some of our past Write Connection programs, you can find the recordings at our website, www.thoroughfarm.org. And we look forward to seeing you at another Write Connection program or here at the farm in the future. Thank you so much. Have a good night.